My name is Robert, one of the pastors here at Redemption Hill. My pleasure to lead us this morning into reading and studying God's Word. As we get started, I'm going to let you in on a little bit of, uh, not so much of a secret, but a little bit of information about me, about us as a family. Uh, I don't know if this works the same way in your household as it does in mine, but though the calendar actually says somewhere around September 22nd is the last day of summer, when school has officially started, summer is officially over. When school starts, summer ends. It doesn't really matter to me what the calendar says. We're already moving on to something else. Uh, But as disappointing as the end of summer is at times to me and to my entire household, the end of summer brings something new as well. It brings a countdown that we all look forward to. We call it the countdown to California. As soon as summer ends, a clock starts And we're counting down the number of days until our family takes its annual pilgrimage out to the left coast. Uh, Every single year now, for about three or or four years, uh, we've been traveling out to Los Angeles for uh, hopefully two, maybe three weeks. Um, And it is a time that my entire family looks forward to. Here's the crazy thing. We started it with an almost five-year-old and an 18-month-old, which is a big trip. Now we've done it with an eight-year-old, a four-year-old, and a two-year-old, the same eight-year-old and four-year-old and two-year-old that though we live a quarter mile from here, sometimes have a difficult time getting from our house to short pump without asking 400 times, are we there yet? Without threatening possibly to toss someone out a window. Uh, Without me wondering if I could just open the door and drop and roll along the interstate and exit myself. But we managed somehow to wake up at 4 a.m., get everybody in the car, get to the airport. And when we're at the airport, get all the seats and all the bags and all the strollers out, checked into the airplane, and make our way through security to a gate where we get on an airplane. And we don't get to go to L.A. We fly to New York. We make it to LaGuardia or JFK, where we have to get out and navigate the airport with an 8-year-old and a 6-year-old and a 2-year-old to get on an airplane where we're going to fly for six hours in a big metal tube with an eight-year-old, six-year-old, and two-year-old. And we land in L.A., and we have to navigate LAX with those same children and mother and father. We have to get our way to the baggage claim, and by God's grace, in four years, we've always had all of our stuff. We have to wait for all of our stuff. I don't know if you've ever waited for your stuff at LAX. We have to wait for all of our stuff. We get all of our stuff, pile all of our stuff up to make our way to a bus, where we get on a bus, and a bus takes us to the rental car place, where we go and we rent a car, where we have to load the car with all of our stuff, get all the seats put in, and then we have to drive in L.A. traffic. I don't know if you've ever driven in L.A. traffic. Though our destination is only like 27.4 miles from the airport, it could take us three plus hours, depending upon the traffic in L.A. On a good day, maybe 45 minutes to an hour, and they have to sit in the car. And we again ride from LAX to our destination. But here's the thing. That same family, that at times, has a difficult time going from right here on the north side to Shore Pump. In four years, I can't remember a single meltdown that anybody has had in a trip like that. And my wife's here, and I asked her between, and she couldn't remember one either. Not a single meltdown in that entire crazy trip. What makes a family like ours, where even I want to jump out of the car sometimes, just going 10 miles down the road, What makes a family like ours capable of making such a long and frustrating trip and not just making it, but making it with joy, making it with excitement? You know what does it? The thought of the Pacific Ocean. The thought of the surf. The reality that it's always 85 degrees. I don't think the sun ever goes down. My family lives in a particular part of Los Angeles where, I kid you not, wild peacocks run through the neighborhood. There are roses everywhere. The adventures that we can tend to have when we're out there, you wouldn't believe me if I told you some of them. But as great as all of those things are, what makes that trip out there worth it? And if you were to ask my kids, they would probably tell you the same thing, is they get two and a half weeks of uninterrupted time with my mom. Two and a half weeks with Graham. Two and a half weeks they don't get for the rest of the year of absolutely uninterrupted love, adoration, attention. 
the stuff is nice, the ocean's nice, the sky is nice, the flowers are nice, but time with my mom makes all the difference in the world. What makes a family like ours that can't get to the grocery store sometimes able to make it from Richmond out to Los Angeles with all the things that get in our way? But what makes it possible is the destination. And the destination makes all the difference in the world. And not only can we make it through all the frustrating things that happen between Richmond and Los Angeles, we can make it 52 weeks from the last time that we were there when we have to make decisions throughout the year and go, you know what? We're going to delay a sense of gratification now. We're not going to go do this right now or we're not going to buy this right now because we're getting ready and saving up to go to L.A. The sense of what's there shapes the way that we respond to a lot of circumstances that we face in life right now because we know that in the end where we're going and what's there when we get there, it's worth whatever sacrifice we have to make to do it. In the past few weeks, I mean, we've been looking at some of the glorious riches of what's called the gospel the glorious riches that Christ has purchased for us and applied to our life uh, by this Holy Spirit, what it means to be justified in the presence of God, uh, what it means to be adopted into his family, just what it means to be sanctified, transformed into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ himself, and just what it means for God now to do work in us and through us to keep us until the very end. And here's what I want us to consider this morning. If the destination transforms the way that my family can view something as trivial as a trip across the country, how much more so should our eternal destination as followers of Christ shape the way that we live our life right here, right now in the midst of a broken world? If our destination as a family can shape the way that not only we go through the trip but face the decisions that we make throughout the year to prepare for it, how much more so as followers of Christ should our eternal destination shape the way that we face not only our difficulties right here, right now, but also the decisions that we have to make in the midst of life in a fallen world. And as we've seen the way that Paul has prepared us and and unpacked us for the riches of the gospel that are true for us right here, right now, he he also said something else in the midst of his letters. He he wrote a letter to a church in Corinth, and he said this, and I want you to kind of hear this as we get started. This same Paul who wrote so brilliantly about the riches that are ours because of Christ said this, if in Christ, if in Jesus, we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Did you hear that? As as glorious as justification is, that big word that we've talked about for the last couple of weeks, as, as glorious as it is to be made right in the image and likeness of Christ before God because of his grace, As glorious as it is to be adopted into God's family, his sons and daughters, because of the work of his son Jesus. As glorious as it is that we know that God is working in us to transform us into the image and likeness of Christ, so that our soul reflects the character of Christ himself. And as glorious as it is to know and believe that right here, right now, God is keeping us till the end, working in us to preserve us, that we may persevere through this life to get to where we're going. As glorious as all of that is for our life right here, right now, the Apostle Paul said, if in Christ we only have hope for that right now, right now, then we're the most to be pitied. It seems as though the Apostle Paul is saying that if there isn't something better than even this to come. And I told the first service, it seems almost blasphemous for me to say it. To say that there's something better coming. As glorious as the riches of the gospel are for our life right now. Paul seems to be saying if there isn't something else. If there isn't something more coming. We better be really honest with ourselves And ask ourselves: Is the obedience worth it? Is the sacrifice really worth it? Are the difficult decisions really worth it? Is the selflessness really worth it? If today, if this life right now, if what we live in and what we have and how we move and breathe right here on this earth right now, if this is how the story actually ends, it seems like Paul is saying, my goodness, regardless of whatever temporal joy temporal success, temporal satisfaction we may have, we stand to be seen on the stage of eternity as the biggest fools of all. And if we're really going to be honest, we have to ask ourselves, if all of these things are only for hope in this life now, now, are we going to be the most pitiable people around? But there has to be something more than this, doesn't there? I mean, there has to be. 
that there has to be something more than the glorious things we've already seen. And the good news is that there actually is. And here's the good news. Our, our view, our view of where we're going, our view of our destination, it will shape our faithfulness in this life right now. It will shape our perspective and our faithfulness in this life right now. now let me just show you an example of this. I just want to read this to you. Um, a pastor in Minnesota named John Piper has done a tremendous service to the church, and he's written a series of, of biographical sketches about great men and women in church history. And he wrote a, a biography, a little sketch of a pastor named Richard Baxter. He was a pastor in the 17th century. And I just want to read you a little bit of what Piper said about Baxter in relation to this idea of the fact that our destination makes all the difference in how we live. It says this, he said, Richard Baxter was a very effective pastor in England in the 1600s. His whole adult life was spent battling one sickness after another. He was harassed by a constant cough, frequent nosebleeds, migraine headaches, digestive ailments, kidney stones, and gallstones. He believed in supernatural healing, and he said several times that he was restored to fruitful labor because of God's direct intervention. Just listen to this one story. He said once a cancerous-looking tumor was in his throat, and it vanished while he was in the pulpit, testifying to God's mercies in his own life. Yet bodily suffering was with him to the end. And he once said that from the time he was 21 years old, seldom an hour was he free from pain. That's his own quote. One of the effects of this suffering was to make him intensely conscious of how temporary his life is and how inevitable death is. Once when he was 35, he was bedbound by one of his diseases and he thought he would probably never recover. He began to meditate on the joys of heaven and the age to come in preparation for leaving this world. He focused especially on what he called the hope of glory and he began to write his thoughts out. To his surprise, he recovered and his thoughts became the book entitled The Saints' Everlasting Rest. He took up the practice, and here's what I want you to catch. He took up the practice of meditating on eternity a half hour each day because of the powerful impact it had on his life. He then went on to commend the same thing to all of his readers. And here's what Baxter said himself. If you would have light and heat, why are you not more in the sunshine? For want or for desire of this recourse to heaven, your soul is as a lamp not yet lit. Okay, get that image in your mind. And your duty, your obedience, is a sacrifice without fire. You got those two images in your head? A lamp not yet lit and a sacrifice on an altar but without fire. Listen to what Baxter said. Go and fetch one coal daily from this altar of eternity and see if your offering will not burn. Keep close to this reviving fire and see if your affections will not be warmed. If you would have light and heat in your soul, why are you not more in the sunshine of eternity? And so this morning, with the rest of our time, we are just going to do the best that we can to sit in the sunshine of eternity as we see it in God's word, as we look at two particular scenes from the book of Revelation. And I just want to read them with you and trust that God will do by his grace and his spirit what Baxter was talking about here. And that as we spend just a few moments contemplating eternity, God would bring light and heat to our affections. So if you've got your Bibles, open them up to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. And we'll start in Revelation chapter 7. And again, a couple of weeks ago, I know I told you we were just going to look at a text and I ended up reading through the entire book of Colossians with you, kind of annotating it as we went. We're not going to read the entire book of Revelation. We're just going to look at two scenes. But I'm going to do something very similar. We're just going to read them and I'm just going to kind of annotate them as we go. Revelation chapter 7, we'll start in verse 9. It goes like this. After this I looked. This is the Apostle John talking. After this I looked. And behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. They were crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. And they all fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God, saying, amen. 
blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes? And from where on heaven have, or from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Verse 15, Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I want you to take the scene in for a minute. It's almost as if we're alongside of John, in a, in a very real sense, eavesdropping on eternity. And I just want you to, to take in the scene. As John begins to depict what his eyes are beholding, who does he see? He sees a great multitude that no one could number. John sees the very tangible and present fulfillment of God's eternal promise. This is how the story started, if you remember. If you remember back in Genesis chapter 12, when God chose a man named Abraham, and he told Abraham that though he had no children of his own, he would have a son. And through him and through his family, a generation would come, a generation so great that no one could ever number it. It would be as futile as numbering the stars in the sky or the grains of sand on the seashore. And that through this people, through this, through this family, God would bless all the nations on the earth. And through this family, people from every tribe, tongue, and nation would not only be blessed, but would come to know God as king. John finds himself getting to eavesdrop in on how the story is going to end. And who does he see? He sees a people, a great people, a people that was so large and so expansive to number them would be futile, a people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. He sees the fulfillment of the promise of God right there. God is a God, is a dad who keeps his promises. What would 30 minutes, what would 10 minutes of consideration on your own before God with his faithfulness to his promises do for you and what you're going through right now. But not only that, as I sat back to think about it, what I was confronted with as I, I thought about the reality of this fulfillment of God's promise and this multitude that was there in eternity, what really hit me as I thought about it this week were all the voices that I tend to have in my head or all the things that I, I read and all the things that I listen to that want to convince me or, or tempt me to think that what God is doing in the earth is ultimately more insignificant than I make it out to be. I don't know if you're familiar with that. I mean, all around me, I'm surrounded by the idea that the gospel is not advancing in the way that we talk about it. That actually, the gospel is being rejected in ways that it's never been rejected before. I mean, the power is not the way it was in the first century. There aren't as many people coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior as we talk about. That you know what? All the ways I talk about the gospel advancing or all the stories that we talk about about what's happening in other countries or other nations, they're all really more exaggerated than they really are. And here's what John says. He says, in the end, just, just as God promised, the people of God are more comprehensive, more expansive, and greater in number than you could ever begin to imagine. Those voices don't get the last word. Our confidence must be placed solely and squarely on the person of God and the faithfulness of God and the character of God to his word. And this is what John is confronted with first and foremost in this vision. God is a faithful God. And his work and the advancement of his gospel, his work to build and reconcile to himself a people, it is more expansive, more comprehensive than we could ever imagine. It's more beautiful than we could ever dream. It wasn't just a multitude so large that nobody could number. It was a multitude that big. I mean, I don't know if you can get your head around that big. Like, if you can get your head around bigness. I don't know if you've ever, what the biggest place you've ever been to really is for me. My son and I went to a, a soccer game a year or so ago, and there were 105,000 people in the stadium. That's big. I don't know if you ever felt like the weight of that many people in one place. When I was in Tokyo last year, downtown, the busiest train station in the entire world, you feel the, the, the 
busyness and the, the magnitude of that number of people. I, I don't know what you have to, to get your head around, but imagine just that kind of multitude, that kind of people. And John says it's just as God promised. It's made up of people from every single tribe, tongue, language, ethnicity, everything that you could ever imagine. I mean, picture all the ways that we try to break up what makes us different from one another. Most of those things are things that we've instituted. We've determined this is what makes us different from each other. Whatever it is, imagine the entire scope of those things all represented and gathered together in a mass so large that it's incomprehensible to number. On earth, that would be sheer chaos. I mean, just be honest, just real, sheer chaos. That many people, that many languages, that many expectations, that many uncertainties, that many unknowns, it'd be crazy. But not in the kingdom of God. But not in the kingdom of God. And this is what John begins to see. And as beautiful as this diversity is, do you know that in eternity, they're not boasting about the diversity? I mean, this is something that I, I realize is something we don't talk about a lot around here, but it's something that gets brought up around here a lot. It, they're not boasting in their diversity as though their diversity is what makes it unique, as though this diversity is what's worth bo boasting about ultimately for all of eternity. Do you know what they're boasting about? They're boasting about one particular type of unity that is only possible because of the grace of God. You want to know what's more magnificent than the beauty of this diversity that you see here in this picture? It's the unity that it actually portrays. John said, who, who are these people? But who are all these people? He said, you know who they are. And the elder said, yeah, they're the ones who have realized the true value of God's redeeming grace. God's redeeming grace. They're the ones who have come through the trials, come through tribulation, and they're the ones who have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. No one's pointing to their cultural superiority. No one's even boasting in the beauty of the diversity. No one's even going, look how great this is, we're so diverse. What is it they're actually boasting in? John said, all these people, this great multitude that you can't even imagine is crying out with a loud voice. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. The only thing worth boasting about for all of eternity is the grace of God. It's the God of grace. All these people, no one's pointing around going, look what we've accomplished. Look at this, somehow we got all the people together. No one's hating each other. Everyone's represented. No. <laughs> standing before the throne, singing, worshiping, crying out with a loud voice, you, God, have done for us what we could never do for ourselves. Salvation, reconciliation, justification, all the things that go with it, being made in the image and likeness of Christ, wearing his white robes of righteousness, it's all because of you. It's got nothing to do with me. It's all because of you. Ten minutes, alone, your soul, the Holy Spirit, thinking about this for just a bit. Begin to ask yourself, what else is there worth celebrating like this? Right, just give yourself for a moment to think about the joy and the exuberance and the reaction that we're going to have in eternity to the grace of God and begin to think about how we do that here and now. What is it we give ourselves over to like that? Is it really worth it? Is it really worth it? So here's the thing as I began to sit with this and, and, and deal with it in my own heart. What I began to struggle with and, and realize until God made it a, a source of encouragement and, and peace for me is that there's going to be a day when we'll stand before the throne of God. And I want you to get this. We won't be anxious. You won't be anxious. You won't be guilt-ridden. You won't wonder if you're good enough for him. You won't be fearful of him. And that promise that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, that he was working in you, 
promising to conform you to the image and likeness of Christ, that your soul will reflect his character, it's, it's got to be done. It's going to be done. And you're going to stand before God. No fear. No sense of shame. No anxiety about it. And it's all due to his faithfulness. It's all due to his grace. God has been victorious. Is there anything else worthy of this kind of celebration? And here's the thing. I just want to kind of temper this a little bit because I don't want some of you to, to take what I'm saying the wrong way. God has given us many things, unending things to enjoy in this life. By no means am I trying to lead you towards some sense of asceticism and sacrifice for the sake then of pleasing God because nothing else is worthy of your joy. It's not what I'm saying at all. We're meant to enjoy the gracious gifts that God gives us here and now in each other and in the world that he's provided for us. But here's the thing. We were never meant to live for those things. You get the difference? They're there for our enjoyment. They're actually means of our worship as we recognize them coming from the hand of a gracious father. We were never meant to live for them. They were never meant to receive this kind of celebration from us. That wasn't their purpose. A few minutes with Revelation chapter 7. Your soul and God's word and his spirit. I think you'll begin to see in a way that only God can impress upon your soul. You were made for so much more than this world. There's something much better coming. You weren't made to be simply satisfied with this. You you were made for another place. John's going to give us just another snapshot, just a scene. A scene. For me, it's been helpful to think that I'm just kind of eavesdropping on this whole idea of eternity with John. He's going to give us another picture in Revelation chapter 21. And turn over there. Let's, let's see the place that we were made for. And again, I just want to encourage you to take Baxter's advice. And, and as we read through this, just make note to spend some time with this this week. A few minutes each day with this. Spend some time in the sunshine of eternity. And I trust you by God's grace and by his spirit, it'll warm you. Revelation chapter 21. We'll start in verse one. Again, just listen. See if you can't begin to just put yourself here. John said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. Here's a ticket, verse 5. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Note who said that. He also said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. Verse 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur which is the second death. What a picture. The key to that picture is found in verse five. The one on the throne makes the declaration, I am making all things new. All things, not just some things. As glorious as it is that we celebrate the renovation and the restoration and the absolute rebirth that God has produced in our hearts through Christ, as we celebrate being made new through through the grace and and love of God, it doesn't simply end with our souls being made new. It doesn't simply end with new hearts. God said he's making all things new. John said he saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
The first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Now, I was reading about this week and and kind of studying this a little bit, and I did actually come across somebody who made a relatively compelling, though unconvincing argument that when John is talking about this passing away of the old earth, that he was talking about the fact that God would basically teleport, for lack of a better word, transport, teleport, us to a new creation in some far off end of the solar system or galaxy that it was already there and that we're basically just going to be kind of bilocated over there. And he was rather compelling, but I don't honestly believe that that's what is being talked about here. But it's becoming pretty popular. That's not what's going to happen. John said he saw the first heaven and the first earth pass away and the sea no more. He saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. The hope of Scripture is that God was going to renew. God was going to restore the whole thing. The Apostle Paul, same guy that we've been looking at for the last few weeks in these glorious riches of of the gospel, he said in the book of Romans that creation itself is groaning inwardly, that our sin brought frustration upon the created order. I don't know if you were here when we looked at the book of Genesis and we started this entire story, but we talked about this, that creation is even suffering under the weight of our curse because of sin. That creation itself is groaning inwardly, awaiting the day, and this is what Paul said, when it itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. This has always been the biblical picture and the scriptural hope. God is going to renew his creation. I I can only give speculation to what that's going to be like. Now, I can't really tell you what the new heavens and the new earth is literally going to be, but it's a beautiful thing to begin to think about. What God's created world will be like without the corruption and bondage of the curse of sin? What possibilities would exist in God's created world? He is making all things new. So it means that some of us are going to have to put away our notions of eternity being forever a a disembodied, floating around on a cloud, maybe if you grew up like me, playing harps and and doing something for all of eternity up in the sky somewhere. That's not the eternity that the scriptures picture. We will be in a new heavens and a new earth. You take some time this week to sit and think about that and the complete restoration that God is bringing to all that he has created. And what it is like to spend eternity in whatever a world created by God free, and we can't even begin to imagine it, free from the disorder, free from the chaos, free from the disruption that we find in the world that we live in. And this is what God has promised But not only is our our soul finally and and freely made like Christ, not only will we then then be clothed like him in those white robes of righteousness, not only will the created order be made new, but something that I have enjoyed this week as we've been reading this, I've enjoyed more than almost any part of it. Our relationship with God will finally be what he had intended it to be from the very beginning. Look at verse 3. John said, I heard a loud voice from the throne. I mean, I can't wait to hear that voice. I, can't, I, told, I didn't tell the first service this, but I, I've prayed for years. If you don't believe me, you can ask my wife. I've prayed for years to wake up one day, because I believe God can do whatever he wants to do. Wake up one day, 6'3", with a voice like Barry White. I just want to have that kind of deep, just big voice. So when I stand up here and say things, I've just got this deep, big voice. I can just bring it. I don't have that. It hasn't happened yet. But one day, we're going to hear this voice. And I I read these texts out loud to you, and I think I can try to make, I can't even begin to come close to this voice. But one day, we're going to hear a loud voice from the throne, the voice of our king, A, a, a voice with a command and a presence and an authority and yet a tenderness like we can't even begin to fathom. And John heard that voice. This is what he said. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. I mean, this is where the whole story's been going from the beginning. God's people in God's place enjoying uninterrupted fellowship with God under God's good and loving word. That's how the story started. 
And the rest of the story has been how God has been about redeeming a people for himself who will spend eternity in his presence, in his place, enjoying him and being ruled and led by his good word. This is where it's all been headed. And here's what hit me this week, maybe for the first time in a, in a, in a real way like it hadn't before. Like I think I've tasted it before, but it, it just kind of impressed upon me in a way this week I, I have to admit I haven't really had before. It, when we are there, and this fellowship is restored to the way that God had intended, we are with him. He is with us, as real as I am with you right now. There will be nothing else in all of eternity that will compare with the delight of being in the presence of God. Nothing. This is the greatest delight and the highest joy of all eternity. No matter what conceptions we might have of what it might be like. You know, and culturally, we always think, you know, the best part of eternity is going to be being reconciled with the people that we've lost in this life. And as sweet as that is, and as encouraging as that is, even in my own soul, losing my own family and kids at times, that's not the greatest joy. That's not the greatest delight. Oftentimes we thought that, that eternity is going to be filled with these particular homes or, or mansions and, and the best golf courses you could ever imagine, and that's what it is. And I don't know what it's going to be like physically. I couldn't tell you. But I know that's not the greatest joy and the highest delight of eternity. The greatest joy and the highest delight that we will have as followers of Christ for all of eternity is being with God himself. He is going to dwell with us. I mean, if we had the time, we could go back to this, the time we spent in the book of Leviticus talking about what it meant for God to dwell in the midst of his people. All that he put in place to try to communicate with us his desire for that, but our unworthiness of it and our need for him to make it possible. And here it is for all of eternity, God fulfilling his promise through his grace to us, and we get to be with God. Nothing in between us. Right? That whole thing I was telling you about earlier, no more guilt, no more anxiety, no more fear. We are with him. He is with us. And when that reality is there, what else is there that can compare? I mean, what else is worthy to compare? And here's what I loved. The more I thought about that, and that just kind of began to warm my heart in a way that it just has never done before. I began to think of what it would be like to be with him. All of a sudden, what John said about God and what he was going to do absolutely devastated me. What does John say in this picture? This is just a, a snapshot of eternity. What this God who is with us and has redeemed us and brought us to himself, what is he going to do to us when we're there? Verse 4 says he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes. That's you. He's talking about you. He is going to wipe every tear from your eyes. John gives us this picture of this great and glorious king, this almighty God who has reconciled us to himself. And he pictures him like this loving father who's going to wipe the tears from our eyes with his finger. What a magnificent picture that is. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. If you've ever just taken some time to sit with that for just a minute, he's going to wipe away our tears. And you know what that means? He says it in just a second. It means there aren't going to be any more tears to cry. There's going to be no more crying. I mean, you just think for a moment what has made you cry in the last week or two. Every single one of you have wanted to. And don't lie. Whether you cried or not physically, you've wanted to. You think about what has made you want to cry. John says in this moment, he's going to wipe the tears from our eyes and there will be no more crying. Death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning. I have shed more tears in the last five, six years over the loss of people in my life than I have loved. Not as a pastor, the funerals I've done for grandmothers, my son, friends. I have shed more tears for people dying in my world. When this day comes, no more death, no more mourning. 
No more crying. No more pain. Former things have passed away. Some of you are in significant pain. If there are two things that bring tears to our eyes more than anything, it's the loss of someone we love or the pain that we're going through or the pain that someone else is going through. Some of you are in significant pain and I've heard your story. Some of you, I have no clue just how painful your life is. In this day, there will be no more pain. No more pain. No more tears that come from pain. Those things, John said, belong to a former way of life, a former world, the world that we're in right now. But this world doesn't get the last word. This world is not the end of the story. It isn't all there is. In this kingdom, for eternity, in the presence of God, pain and death will be replaced by life. By life. Give yourself 10 minutes, 15 minutes this week with God, with his word, with his promise. See if it doesn't help you have perspective on the world and the circumstances that you face right here and right now. John isn't making these things up. Some of you might think he's just coming up with the most fanciful things and the most desired things that he could come up with and this is what he's promising. But for those who would have heard this letter read and for for those of us who have been around through the whole story as we've been reading through the Bible, you'll hear the echoes of God's promises that he gave to his people back in the Old Testament through the prophets and all of what John's saying. And just listen, this is from Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah said, behold, this is God speaking, I will create a new heavens and a new earth. John didn't make that up. The former things will not be remembered, nor will they come to mind. That former way of life, John isn't making that up. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. In the presence of God for all of eternity, there is inexpressible, unending joy. God says, be glad, be joyful, rejoice forever in what I will create. Listen to what he said in Isaiah. Never again will there be an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his years. The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all of my holy mountain. Eternity is forever in the presence of God with unending joy. The psalmist said it in Psalm 16, in your presence, God, is fullness of joy. In your right hand or at your right hand are are pleasures forevermore, pleasures for all of eternity. That's what the psalmist said. In, In Revelation 21, we get a glimpse of the fact that we get to actually experience it, that God is faithful to his promises. 10 minutes with that, 10 minutes with that, And with God's spirit, and I honestly believe he'll begin to impress upon your heart that he who dies with the most toys doesn't actually win. He doesn't actually win. I think you'll begin to see that it makes absolutely no sense. It's ultimately foolish in the end to live as though this is all there is. It's an unwise decision. We're made for so much more. There's so much more yet to come. Eternity is forever in the presence of God with unending joy. But I'd be remiss if I didn't also mention the fact that not only is eternity in the presence of God with unending joy, but there is unchangeable justice for some. In verse seven, John said, the one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Here's the thing. The day is going to come. God will make all things new. Just as he said, he will make all things new. And every single one of us will stand before this king and we will be judged. And as we've seen in this entire story, God will judge us faithfully. His justice will be just, if you can even say that. And here's the thing. No one wants to stand before God on that day and be judged by your own merit. That's just the reality. 
No one wants to stand before God on that day and be judged based on your own merit. Your merit will get you nothing but eternal condemnation. But here's the great news. This is the great news of the gospel that we've been talking about all along. You can stand before God on that day and you can sense and you can feel and you can receive his just judgment because you're standing before God on the basis of someone else's merit. There's another person's merit that you can stand on on this day. This is what we've been talking about all along. We talk about how Jesus humbled himself and and left his throne in eternity and came down and he lived a life on this earth, the one that you and I were created by God to live, yet he lived it perfectly, tempted in every way that you and I are, yet he did it without sin. And then Jesus, this same Jesus, willingly laid his life down to be crucified on a cross in our place for our sin, taking upon himself the eternal and just wrath of God on his body for our sin. He became our final acceptable sacrifice. God, accepting Jesus' sacrifice, raised him from the dead. Jesus, defeating death itself, has now ascended to the right hand of God so that every single person who places their faith in Jesus, when you trust in him, He then clothes you in his righteousness. There's that white robe that John was talking about. He then clothes you in his right standing so that on that day when you stand before your king and his justice is exacted upon you, you're standing not on your own merit, but you're standing on the merit and the worth of Jesus himself, the perfect one. If you've never trusted in Jesus, not simply for forgiveness, but for his righteousness, for his right standing before God. If you've never trusted in Jesus, I can only encourage you and implore you this morning to trust in him. Trust his perfect life. Trust his sacrificial death. Trust his victorious resurrection. Trust his righteousness. Stand on his merit alone when you come into this day. Confess, the Bible says, that he is in fact king. Believe that God has raised him from the dead. The Bible says you do this and you will be saved. You will stand before God on the merit of Jesus Christ and not your own. Those who do that, they're the ones whose robes have been washed white in the blood of the Lamb. They're the ones who John says will gather with a multitude so great that no one can count, made up of people from every tribe, tongue, and nation on the earth. They're the ones who will spend eternity in the presence of God who will see him face to face, whose tears will be wiped away, whose bodies will be made new, and who will dwell in the presence of God in the new heavens and on the new earth forever. And these great visions of eternity, these great scenes of eternity are brought to a close with a refrain from Jesus himself in chapter 22. Three times in the next chapter, Jesus says this to end the book. Behold, I'm coming soon. Three times, verse seven, verse 12, and verse 20. Behold, I'm coming soon. Behold, listen, I'm coming soon. Behold, I'm coming soon. That is his promise. He is coming soon. And John ends with the cry of his people, the cry of the church. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Let me pray for us this morning. God, we thank you so much that you have revealed yourself to us, that we get to know you. We thank you that your word, you've given us your word. It comes from you and it is trustworthy and it is true. And we're not left with the speculation of philosophers and the empty promises of various leaders, but we have your very words. Jesus, we thank you so much for getting off of your throne, for humbling yourself and coming into human history as a man, to be tempted, to be opposed, to be despised, to be betrayed, to suffer, and ultimately to be murdered in our place. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that today your tomb is empty, that when you said it's finished, it truly is. Thank you that though the wages for sin is death, you have died in our place, and that makes you worthy of our eternal worship. 
thank you that as we repent, you forgive us of anything and everything, and you turn us into worshipers. All these great visions that we read in, in Revelation, Lord, we look forward to the day that we shall see you face to face. We'll know you as we're fully known, that we'll be with you, and we will stand right where John stood. You are a great God. By grace, by your grace, please make us a transformed people for your namesake. Amen.